Hello out there YouTubers and welcome to P.E. Slick Podcast. I'm your host Matt here. Each week I'm going to bring you something different in terms of leadership, ministering, entertainment, book authoring, and much more. But before we begin each time, I'm going to be airing a classic throwback commercial from back in the 80s or 90s or 2000s for my personal liking. Stay tuned. Water clean, really disinfect, really deodorize. Mmm, so clean. Get broad spectrum pine saw liquid because you really care about clean. And I'm back. Joining me this week is Mr. John Pomeroy. Now, this man is a talented gentleman. He's worked on a lot of films at Disney. He worked with Don Bluth. He is a painter. He is he is on his way. He's even working with the uh, Art of Pomeroy Art Academy, and I'm pleased that he took the time to be a part of my podcast. How you doing, John? Good to be here, Matt. Thank you. I'm doing very well. All righty. Uh, let's get things started with uh, where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm from uh, South Central Los Angeles, <laughs> which is, I mean, uh, it, it, that was my hometown base. Till from age one till age fifteen, and then my my family moved to Riverside County. But my dreams of wanting to get in the animation industry started there on three thirty three West eighty eighth Place in South Central Los Angeles. Gotcha. What were your hobbies growing up? Oh, let's see. I love building models. Um, I love drawing. I love sculpting, um, and I loved uh, making puppets. And sculpting and puppets were kind of the things, Matt, that kind of led me into animation. I remember one summer I wanted to make a uh, a perfect replica of the puppet of Pinocchio from the Disney animated feature. And I went to the uh, Los Angeles Public Library to look for some pictorial reference. Right. And um, went through files and picture files, came across a book called The Art of Walt Disney that was published way back in 1941, during the golden age of Disney animation. And I started reading the book and looking at the pictures. And I read the book, and I read the book, and then read the book again. I read the book about ten times. And it started to burn an interest in me for animation. Forgot about making the puppet and just kept reading this book. And it told about their productions of uh, Fantasia, Snow White, Pinocchio, Dumbo, and Bambi. And I became increasingly uh, excited about the idea of working there. Uh, I wanted to become a background artist because I love painting. And I wanted to be able to paint backgrounds that I saw like in Bambi and Snow White and Pinocchio. And I began writing a series of letters to Disney Studios one letter almost every other week. I would be just peppering them with questions on how do you do this and what kind of papers do you use in your animation? What kind of uh, background uh, cardboard do you paint on for your background? What kind of brushes do you use? What kind of pencils do you use? And so it just all started then. This is like we're talking about 1965, 66. Right. And that was when my, my love for the animation craft start to start to bloom. Okay. Um, do you do you overall have a favorite Disney movie by the way? You know, it's hard because uh there are so many. I mean I love Fantasia, I love uh Pinocchio. I think one of my favorites is Peter Pan. Gotcha. And uh, uh, the animation, particularly on Captain Hook, I've always loved and it was kind of interesting because the man who created that character became one of my future mentors at Disney Studio when I first started there in the 70s, an animator by the name of Frank Thomas. Uh, he was a member of a group of elite animators called the Nine Old Men. Right. And it was just an honor to work with him. He was actually my supervising animator uh, in my first animation that I did professionally at Disney Studios, which was on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 back in 1972-73. Okay. So when you first, what year did you join Disney? In 72? Um, well, it, it, 
It, it was February 7th, 1973. It took okay. me three portfolios, Matt, to finally get accepted into the program. Um, my first portfolio I took there when Walt was still alive. This is September of 1966. Uh, some friends of mine drove me from Riverside County out to Burbank, got to the guard at the gate, showed him my portfolio, and he said, oh, this well, is really nice, but I'm afraid you can't come in. We're not hiring right now. So, but I wasn't shattered. I, I was not I was actually exhilarated, but I actually had sex with her on of me. That's why we're the not, studio right. lot. And I was, I was just amazed, oh, uh, and it was enough excitement to last me, you know, for another two or three years. And I went to Art Center College of Design and prepared another portfolio that I submitted in 1972, and once again, I got rejected. Oh. That, one, that, one, that one was difficult. And then the following year, I submitted a third time, and this time I got accepted. And uh, my sister-in-law had a family friend, uh, a guy by the name of Jack Hanna. Not to be com- confused with Hanna Barbera. Uh, I was thinking that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, that's Bill Hanna. But Jack Hanna was the um, director of all the Donald Duck short cartoons back in the 40s and 50s, and uh, he was he had um, you know he was a, a, a director there on the lot, and so I called him and he set up my second and my third uh, portfolio appointments with uh, the animation supervisor at the time. Ed Hansen, and they were working on the production of Robin Hood, the animated feature film from Disney. Right. And uh, that's kind of how I was actually able to get my foot in the door. And on the third try, they accepted me into their animation training program. And I told them, I said, I would love to be a background artist. And they said, uh, well, you'll be a better background artist if you learn the basics of animation. That way you'll paint to support the animation art form and not yourself as a solo artist. So I said, hey, I will do anything you guys want me to do. So I started uh, in February 73 as uh, animation trainee, and my uh, my teacher, my mentor, was another member of the Night Old Men group, Eric Larson. And Eric, uh, if the studio needed anybody to be a kind and gentle teacher, it was Eric. Uh, he was mentor to dozens of us animation trainees when we first started. Right. And uh, uh, he helped me do my first personal pencil test of this uh, uh, magician frog that I had designed and his little assistant who was a turtle. And I saw this thing on what we call a moviola. It was like a projection system where you can look down into a screen and see your 35-millimeter film pencil test projected through it. And I watched this image, and it came to life for me, even though it was horrible to watch my own animation, something bit me, and uh, I became hooked on actually animating and moving the characters rather than painting the background. So I threw away the paintbrushes and devoted myself to becoming an animator, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, it's, I'm, I, I mean, I'm almost uh, a half a century into my professional career as an animator now. Right, <laughs> and it never and it never gets boring, Matt. It's always exciting, always exhilarating. Right, yeah, I'm I'm a fan of the nine old men from Disney. I, I love Eric Larson's uh, animation on Bambi. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, in, a, in in my first six years at Disney, uh, I got to work with Wooly Reiterman, who was my director on. Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, and also on The Rescuers. I got to work for uh, Ollie Johnson, who was my supervising animator. I helped him animate Penny, a uh, little orphan girl in Rescuers. Right. Uh, got to work with the Titanic animator, uh, one of the best in the business, Milt Call, another member of the Nine Old Man. And uh, John Lounsbury, who was wonderful, sage talent. I mean, uh, he was my director. Uh, also on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. And it was, each one of these men were very, um, I, I would say, very important in my first six years of growth as an animator. Each of them had their own special ability that kind of impart, imparted their, their secrets to me about animation. Of course, I mentioned Frank Thomas. He was probably 
the most skilled as an actor, an animating actor. And um, um, they, it was just a great, great time, great experience. It was the perfect timing because if I had come there a little bit earlier, I would have been uh, swept up into the production of Robin Hood and would have probably ended up being some other animator's assistant for about two or three years. But because of what, the time I came, uh, I went through three to four months of the animation trainee program, and they promoted me immediately to animating uh, on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 as an animator. Right. Under the supervision of Frank Thomas, which was absolutely amazing. Now, when you came to Disney, of course, this was some time after Walt had passed away. Um, right. Lee, this, this was a talented man. He had built a lot. And he was working on Disney World and Epcot. And his brother Roy had took over things until he passed, unfortunately. Um, now, what was the atmosphere like at Disney? I know people say that that was a time where people was kind of saying, you know, what would Walt have done? What would Walt have done and all that? Yeah. It was uh, – I remember – before I actually got employed with Disney Studios, and I was just uh, writing letters to them, and I was an animation enthusiast, and uh, this was right around the time that I went there with my first portfolio when I was living in Riverside. I remember hearing on the radio that Walt had just passed away, and I was crushed. I remember I was crying that night. I remember staying up till about 1 or 2 in the morning watching news shows that were paying homage to the great Walt Disney. And on there, I remember seeing that talk show. Uh, it might have been with someone like Tom Snyder, someone like that, a late-night show, and he was interviewing Wooly Reiterman and Frank Thomas. And this is the first time I actually got to see these men alive speaking on TV. And I just watched them. And uh, Wooly, of course, they were both distraught, but Wooly basically said, well, we're going to continue – feature animation uh, the way Walt intended and the way Walt trained us. And uh, we're getting ready to embark on our next feature, which is the Aristocast. We are wrapping up production on Jungle Book, getting that ready for release. So my hopes were kind of renewed because I, I felt that there was going to be a continuance of the legacy that Walt set into motion when he was alive. And uh, the legacy was continued by Willie Reiterman. Willie Reiterman was an interesting guy because Walt kind of hand-picked him during the 50s to begin um, as a sequence director on Lady and the Tramp. Then he became another sequence director on Sleeping Beauty. And then he became a sequence director on 101 Dalmatians. And by the time um, Jungle Book came around, Willie Reiterman was the director of the entire show. Right. And if it hadn't been for Walt replicating some of his abilities in Willie Reiterman, I don't know if the animation, if the uh, feature animation studio would have been able to continue after Walt died. But Willie Reiterman was the successor, and he continued the development and the growth of uh, Disney feature animation. And so when I came on the scene, they were just finishing up Robin Hood, they were getting ready to start uh, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, and they had plans uh, in story going forward with the Rescuers. And then even after the Rescuers, I think they were getting ready to start on Peach Dragon and then on to Fox and Hound. So they had a lineup of products, which was very encouraging to me because they, they, were, they were meaning to continue uh, the work that they had been doing in the previous 30 years as well. Right. Uh, but this, I, my hat's off to Willie Reiterman. He was a former um, uh, bomber pilot during the Second World War. He had he would smoke cigars as he was looking at your work. I mean, he was a very commanding figure, but he was very kind uh, to me. Uh, he, 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 he was, uh, you know, some of the things that I learned from him were about the uh, animation industry being a collaborative medium and not solo. In other words, you need the help of your coworkers always to get insight as to how to make your work stronger and better, how to make your performance better, uh, even go to get drawings to help you get the very, very best you can for your animation. Right. So, great guy to work with. When you were at Disney, did you meet or interact with uh, Larry Clemens or Vance Gary? I did. Um, Vance 
Matt Scary was great. Um, he um, um, long history as the story man, story sketch artist with Disney. Worked on um, Jungle Book, Aristocats, Robin Hood. I think I don't know when he started. He probably got his start maybe in the early or mid fifties. Uh, Larry Clemens was. He was a funny guy. I mean, I think he, he uh, wrote jokes for being Crosby and Bob Hope sometime early in his career for radio. Yeah. He was an interesting guy because uh, Wooly would always turn to Larry for gags. Um, if the if a storyline seemed to be sagging, he would get Larry to storyboard and come up with gag ideas that would kind of, you know, uh, bolster the action and... and create moments of levity as the story is getting too serious. Um, and he was a fixture. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know when Larry started there. There's an interesting film back in 1941, Matt, called The Reluctant Dragon. Yep, I know that and one. <laughs> you know, and there's that live action segment where the comedian is taking the tour, Robert Benchley is taking the tour of the studio, and he goes into what they call a sweat box story meeting with Walt. And way in the back, you can see a couple of old story men. I've seen pictures of them. Uh, Ted Sears. And I think Larry Clements is in there, too. I think it is because it looks like him. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, they were they were great guys. Uh, there was Dave Mitchner, Fred Lucky, uh, Ted Berman, who became director later on, I think, in Fox and Town. There was, uh, uh, of course, Larry Clements and uh, Vance Terry. All great guys. One of them I wanted to touch on, um, by the way, I, I have a friend of mine named uh, Devin Cheese. He is a big fan of this one movie I wanted to touch on because you left Disney and worked with Don Bluth and you came back and you worked on Pocahontas and did John Smith. Um, what was what was that like working on Pocahontas? It was uh, terrific. Uh, it was kind of my um, – the prodigal son returning home <laughs> because <laughs> – you know, I, I left there in 1979 with Don Bluth and Gary Goldman, and we started our own company. We were uh, joint members of Don Bluth Productions, and it became Sullivan Bluth Studios when we went to Ireland. But um, it's funny. The reasons why we left uh, Disney are kind of my same reasons why I left Don Bluth. We were having uh, uh, difficulty, I think, in the story area. Right. And back in the late 70s, we noticed that uh, Disney Studios was kind of in a creative rut. And it didn't look like they were going to be breaking any new ground like they did uh, when Walt was, you know, still active. Um, and that was, that was Walt's trademark. He was a visionary. Right. Uh, and he, he uh, never stopped trying out new things. Well, that, that, uh, that type of motion was, I don't know, kind of fading away, I think. They they were kind of creating stories that we thought weren't really challenging the medium or challenging us as artists, and they seemed kind of repetitive. And uh, it was one of the things that kind of uh, prompted us to get together and um, leave and start our own company. And um, ironically, back in the uh, late 90s, uh, or no, in the late 80s and early 90s, I found that we were making the same mistake as storytellers. Don, Gary, and myself were kind of, a, I felt we were in a creative rut. Um, and less and less I got time to draw and uh, be an animator. I found myself more in executive command, being more of a producer type and uh, an executive type. Right. And I, I was burning out as an artist, man. And so I sold my shares of the stock in the company, and I left uh, my partnership with them in, in 1992. And I went off to paint. I went back to painting. So I had about a 17-year hiatus away from painting. Remember I was telling you the story about I saw my first pencil test in animation. I said, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Well, I went back to painting, and painting kind of helped. Uh, heal me. <laughs> it kind of uh, uh, gave me an artistic rebirth and reboot and reset. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine, Sonny Apichapong Yang, he's a uh, art director and painter. Uh, he works at Disney Studios and uh, 
he was having painting workshops, and I attended two series of them, and it just did wonders for me. And so I got back into painting. And right about that time, an old friend of mine, uh, Don Hahn, Don Hahn, when we, I left Disney Studios, he was just starting to work. He worked with uh, Don Blues as his assistant director on Pete's Dragon, and uh, he was starting to work his way up as uh, uh, production manager, like on, I think it was Black Cauldron. Right. Don gave me a call, and he said, hey, are you interested in coming back? And I said, oh, could be. He said, well, why don't we go have lunch? And so we had lunch, and it was just a, a wonderful reuniting of a dear old friend. Uh, he wanted me to come back and, and because they were getting ready to embark on the production of Pocahontas, and uh, they were interested in me animating uh, Captain John Smith. So he set up a meeting with me and Jeffrey Katzenberg. And our meeting was terrific. And then I met Peter Schneider and Tom Schumacher. That meeting went terrific. And the next thing I know, I'm back at Disney working again and working alongside another dear old friend of mine, Glenn King. And Glenn and I, our history goes back to maybe 1975. Um, he uh, graduated from Cal Arts Animation Program and went right to work into the uh, Animation Trainee Program. And I remember meeting Kent Glenn. Back in 1973, 74, they started asking myself and Don Blues to participate in the um, animation recruiting program because now Disney was getting really aggressive with growing the new crop of animators to take over for the guys that were retiring. Right. So I remember I set up a um, a large uh, auditorium uh, of students. Uh, Back in 1974, uh, I set up a great big kind of an animation seminar, a Disney animation seminar at Art Center College of Design. And that went over really well. And we repeated this, this again with um, Cal Arts, uh, California Institute of the Arts. We went there, uh, remember Ken Anderson, another great story man. Um, yep. <laughs> um, uh, Milk Call, Ollie Johnson, um, uh, Willie Reiterman, and Frank Thomas. And Don and myself went to Cal Arts to screen uh, this new class of 2D animators. And uh, one of the animators I got to meet was Glenn King. And uh, he was a student then. He was very excited. He was he, he was truly excited the fact that I was so young. Uh, I was maybe one or two years older than him. And he's speaking to a guy who was now an animator, which gave him a lot of hope and a lot of excitement. So that was our first encounter back then. And a couple of years, about a year and a half later, he went through the training program and then came in uh, under uh, Ollie Johnston's uh, supervision and actually animated some of the uh, uh, Penny scenes in, in uh, uh, The Orphan Penny for the movie Rescuers. Okay. And it was just a really nice moment, and I remember, you know, Working with him, uh, he, we worked together on uh, a little bit on uh, Pete's Dragon and on Fox and Hound. So reuniting with him on Pocahontas was a real joy. But by this time, Glenn had developed himself into, had grown into this animation superpower. He was, his drawing got immensely stronger. He was extremely good in acting. And uh, he was kind of there golden boy there at the studio when I returned in 92. He had animated uh, the lead character Ariel on Little Mermaid. He animated the lead character in Beauty and the Beast, the Beast. He animated the uh, uh, lead character Aladdin. So his career was just flourishing. And now he was animating Pocahontas, uh, the lead character for that movie. And I was alongside of him working on Captain John Smith. We had rooms next to each other. I remember late nights, we'd be working there till 1 and 2 in the morning uh, because the supervising animators, each of us had like, you know, 15, 14, 15 other animators in our crew. And we would spend the entire day supervising and correcting and looking at their work. And so we would never get our, our chance to actually animate production footage wouldn't come until after everybody left at around 6 o'clock. Right. That's, we get to work on our own things. So, I mean, it was very, uh, very intense schedule and, and process, but uh, it was, I couldn't have asked for a better, you know, teammate to work alongside. He's a great guy. And uh, 
the the atmosphere was one of the corporation had grown from the time I left uh, 13, 14 years prior. It was a smaller company. I mean, feature animation was, you know, about 35 to 40 guys that did, you know, features like Jungle Book and Four of the Stone and 101 Dalmatian. Now it was immense. I mean, there were uh, there was a Disney World now. The uh, Disney uh, product was worldwide. There were uh, 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 plans. I think I'm not sure if Disneyland, Disney World in Paris, uh, that might have been already created. I mean, it was huge. It was about uh, 20 times bigger as a corporation than when I left back in 1979. Right. And the the uh, the studio was buzzing because, I mean, it's now, it was now not just one studio, but it, it seemed to be like a studio that was immersed in about four or five different productions. When I came back in 92, they were also working on Lion King. They were working on Fantasia 2000. They had maybe a dozen other projects in the pipeline and development. Um, I mean, it was just huge. Uh, and rather than the 35 to 40 key members of the staff, now it was in the hundreds. And uh, while Glenn and I are working on uh, Pocahontas, we're hearing about uh, this company up in Northern California called Pixar that was doing Toy Story at the same time. So the Disney franchise and Disney product was just exploding. I mean, uh, it was so much huge. It's so much bigger than before. And, and uh, certainly, I mean, when I was there during the 70s, we were, um, the executive command was uh, uh, Card Walker and uh, Ron Miller, uh, Walt's son-in-law. Right. And um, uh, Ron Miller, I mean, he was, I loved working with him. He's an ex-Ram football player. We used to go outside and throw passes to each other. But he had his limitations creatively. And, um, um uh, they, uh, I guess they vote, the board of uh, directors voted him out and replaced him with uh, Roy Disney Jr. And right. And Roy, Roy Disney Sr.'s son. And Roy Disney Jr., I never saw him on live. I think he, I think there was some sort of a dynamic between him and Ron Miller or something where he just not was, was not welcome. I don't remember ever seeing him there. But he was now kind of the, uh, uh, the powerhouse behind the studio now. He went out and helped um, recruit uh, Frank Wells, Michael Eisner, and Jeffrey Katzenberg from other studios to give the Disney uh, the Disney company uh, a reset, a, a boost. And they started to get heavily into live action films with the Silver Screen Partners, and on and on and on. So I mean, the 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 corporation was just growing. Um, and I remember, I think he might have, he recruited from uh, Broadway musicals. And he went to Broadway, and uh, I think that's when they started recruiting people like uh, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. Right. To help write, uh, music for their animated feature films, as well as help write story. Uh, uh, I think Tom Schumacher was recruited also from the Broadway music scene, along with about 12 other executives that came in and kind of gave a refresh to the, actually, it, it kind of started up the animation renaissance there at Disney. Um, and one of the things I've always thought that was interesting was when we left, when I left with Don and Gary, uh, we knew that this would help the industry because at that point we thought, are we kind of witnessing the uh, extinction of quality animation as we know it? Because there was really only Disney and there was, uh, H&B, Hanna-Barbera, doing television animation. Right. Uh, there wasn't much else going on, no competition. And competition breeds excellence. So we thought, okay, if we can go out there and make a feature film, we can be competitive to Disney Studio, that'll help the animation industry and the animation product grow. And it did, because um, Disney went through their renaissance almost as a reaction to the Bluth product. Uh, Bluth... Um, uh, Don and I and Gary, when we partnered with Steven Spielberg and produced American Tale, that made, that made Rumble's 
in the animation industry because for the first time, an animated feature film since Snow White has gone out there and made dollar figures that were competitive to live action box office winners. Uh, went out there in the uh, summer of uh, 86 and uh, grossed about 65 to 70 million dollars in its first run, which was phenomenal. So I think that, that itself was a, a goose to Disney wanting to rebrand themselves and reinvent themselves as the as the king of animation worldwide. Right. So, and that was the one of the things I was walking into also. There was no, uh, there was a lot of hostility at Disney with the executive command towards us because when we left in 79, we basically walked out of there in the middle of uh, their production of Fox and Hal. Um, and so that, that left a lot of um, a lot of soreness, I think, with the executive command. When I came back, that didn't exist anymore, at least as, as far as I can see. It was kind of a welcome home. It was great having me back, and uh, I was grateful. And uh, my my contract with them at that time was that I would serve as supervising animator on Bill Kahanis, and then I would be given a chance to produce. That never happened, and I'm kind of glad it didn't because producing – takes you away from the drawing board. Right. You can't be creative. You can't animate. And so I'm just glad that uh, the good Lord <laughs> watched over my progress as uh, a supervising animator there because I got to keep drawing. I got to animate. After Pocahontas came um, Fantasia 2000. And by this time, I had gotten in. Uh, I got into a relationship with Roy Disney Jr. Uh, he was our next door neighbor when we lived in Toluca Lake. Oh, and we became friends. And it's like it seemed like every other week I was in his office pitching an idea or praying with him about the company or or whatever, just chit chatting about his uh, his new yacht that he was building. He was really into uh, uh, sailing. Um, and so he was just a great guy, and I got to know him uh, when we were working on uh, Fantasia 2000. He um, he gave me a year to develop my own sequence, and and then uh, after a year, it, it, they just didn't think it was working out as a uh, as a Disney piece for Fantasia. So they uh, asked me if I would be interested in animating the uh, Firebird in the Firebird suite, and I said sure. And so Roy moved me on to that, and I worked with the uh, the two Gritzy brothers, Paul and Gay Khan, for okay. about a year yeah. uh, on that production. You've had quite a history, John, um, from the time you came in the 70s, um, even when you left and you came back. You had, you had quite a long renaissance there at Disney. I know our time is dwindling, but one thing I want to touch on, you now you worked on a couple of good movies. You talked about one of them, um, American Tale. Um, now, the movies that you guys worked on, um, I guess you can say you, Gary, and Don were like the three musketeers because I worked real well together to the point where you formed Don Blue Productions. And now, for the movies I never really seen or knew about that well until like maybe recently was, uh, y'all did movies, uh, Rockadoodle, Thumbelina, uh, Troll yeah. and Essential Park, and The uh, Pebble and the Penguin. Right, correct. Right. Those four, I didn't know that well, because I know there was a, a man named uh, Ralph uh, Blue. He, uh, he was another production company that made some movies, um, and Steven Spielberg was out as well. And yeah. one movie, that, uh, two movies that I, I helped dear as a kid is I did All Dogs Go to Heaven yeah. and, and The Land Before Time. Now, that was interesting how y'all did a story about dinosaurs. Yes, that was uh, that was the brainchild of um, Steven Spielberg. Uh, towards the end of production on American Tale, we had a meeting with him, and after lunch, uh, he gathers us around. He said, "Guys, I, I've got a story I want to propose to you about a little dinosaur that uh, his name is Littlefoot, and he basically had all the tent poles for a really neat feature film." And uh, he wanted to bring in his buddy, George Lucas. So George Lucas came and became co-executive producer alongside uh, Steven Spielberg. And uh, it was a great production. We re I really enjoyed working on it. Uh, I still, we still, I'm still in contact with um, 
uh, Stu Krieger, who wrote the screenplay. Uh, Stu and I got together after, you know, years had passed on. We were trying to market our children's books that we were writing together. Um, but, I mean, it was a great production. Uh, that was a transitional piece, too, because um, the budget was of such a nature that we needed to do it out of the country. Uh, and our uh, uh, CEO, Morris Sullivan, was reaching out to overseas, uh, overseas to other countries in South America, Canada, Asia, and in Europe about starting a studio facility there. And the one that came back uh, that was most favorable was Ireland. The uh, Industrial Development Authority of Ireland came back and said, we would love for you to come here. We have talent that's leaving our Ireland in, in droves because there's no there's no work for them to do here. Right. So in uh, uh, 1986, we upped our studio with about 60 of our employees from America and relocated to Dublin. And it was an amazing experience in that land before time is about different races of people and different cultures coexisting together for one for one means, uh, right. for one vision. And it turned out, you know, with our, the American culture intermingling with the Irish culture, it was almost like we were mirroring the story that we were actually creating that, which was really kind of interesting. Right. And, um, uh, a lot of talented people in Ireland. Uh, we went from maybe 60 employees that we had to about 400. So we swelled up in ranks quite a bit with people getting involved in editorial, background, layout, animation, cleanup, uh, uh, test camera, color model. In every department, just, you know, we were recruiting and teaching. Um, Irish talent, and uh, to this day, you'll see a lot of members, you'll see the, you know, a, uh, a, a, a odd-looking Gaelic Irish name on the screen credit, and it will probably be, have been someone that we trained way back in 1986-87. Right. And uh, one of the names, it's so funny, I see the name, um, uh, one of my favorite TV shows is uh, Spongebob. And one of the art directors I'm always seeing uh, listed on there is Sean Dempsey, and I'm sure it's the Sean Dempsey that we trained way back in 1986-87. Uh, and it was it was a wonderful time. I, I uh, met my wife there. My uh, Cammy and I got married there in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, Gary Goldman's house right. in Rock, Ireland. So there's a lot of fond memories. I'm hoping. Maybe one day we can take our children there to Ireland and kind of visit all of our old places where we used to visit. Uh, but some good memories there. Yeah. My wife, Candy, and I, we moved back to California in 1988, August of 1988, because a lot of the um, uh, American talent that went to Ireland with us initially said they would get two years of their time, and then they want to return back to home in California. And so we had to set up kind of a splinter studio, uh, which we did in Burbank, California, called Southern Blue Studios. Uh, and between 1988 well, and 1992, that was kind of my home base when we came uh, back and returned. And that's I where we did uh, We finished up. We did uh, Land Before Time in Dublin, and we started to work, uh, got about halfway through production on All Dogs Go to Heaven. Then I finished All Dogs Go to Heaven, uh, my sections in uh, Burbank, and then on to um, uh, Rockadoodle, Thumbelina, and then Troll and Central Park. Okay. Um, and before we wrap, um, can you mention something about Pomeroy Art Academy? Yes. So Pomeroy Art Academy is a, a tutorial system that uh, we've kind of been working on for the past couple of years. It's basically, it will be my approach to animation, um, feature animation, um, for three different tiers of uh, students. So the uh, first tier would be for the very young audience. Uh, I've got a lot of homeschool moms that have been approaching me for years now wanting to know, do I teach any kind of uh, tutorial that their young 8- or 12-year-old can learn from? 
So the first tier of Pomeroy Art Academy will be addressing them. And then the second tier would be the more advanced uh, curriculum about uh, feature animation approaches, how to do um, uh, dialogue, how to perfect your acting performance on paper, um, how to, you know, do the uh, appropriate lip sync in your dialogue, uh, how to do animation water effects, how to storyboard, how to design characters. Uh, and then the third tier would be, which will be for professional level, of how to do CG animation, how to do digital animation, how to do layout, how to do advanced storyboarding. And uh, uh, we're going to be filming uh, the first five or six lessons, I think, at the end of February, and then hopefully we'll be able to launch this sometime between April and May. And it'll be kind of an online subscription uh, access. And uh, if it takes off, it'll be wonderful. I mean, I'm... Um, Social media has been kind of a stranger to me. Uh, we had a, I remember having a dinner with a dear friend of mine who was convincing me that I needed to get on social media. This was about two years ago. Right. Finally did, and it's like, uh, in Instagram, I think I've got almost uh, 30,000 followers in the year and a half that I've been on Instagram. So there is a huge art audience out there for 2D animation. 2D, I think, is making a resurgence, too, because I think... A lot of the fans I encounter at conventions, they want 2D pencil animation. You know, I think they're tired of duplicated reality with uh, digital animation. Right. Uh, they've seen it. You know, they, they, they want something more. And there, I say, you know, there's plenty of room for both. It's a shame that 2D animation got phased out as it did at Disney Studios. But I thought, you know, maybe that was a blessing in disguise in 2003 when um, – Michael Eisner started to close down the feature animation studio in Burbank, as well as Orlando, Florida, and in uh, Paris, France, because it was a great migration of animation talent that roamed the globe and found their way into college and university art departments around the world. Right. And they became involved in teaching classes, teaching courses, and teaching the basics of animation and creating an appetite out there for a worldwide resurgence for this great craft that we do. So, and that's what Pomeroy Academy, Art Academy, will address. Pomeroy Art Academy will be kind of uh, mainly um, showcasing the, the ways and means and secrets of 2D animation with some guest instructors that I'll have who will talk about digital animation, animation effects, putting together character designs. So, we're very excited about that. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to launch that sometime in uh, April and May. Okay, okay. Um, John, thank you for taking the time to be a part of my podcast. Um, I know you got a busy schedule ahead of you right now, but I appreciate you coming on and talking about your time. Um, well, it's going I hope I can 45. have you come back because there's like okay, a lot yeah. more I would love to talk with you in my podcast, especially with animation. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me. That's no problem. We'll be back in just a moment after this commercial break. These EverReady batteries have always offered value for money. But now they're being replaced by EverReady's new zinc carbon battery, Silver Seal. In continuous tests, Silver Seal lasts on average twice as long as even our Power Plus range, but costs no more. That's a lot more staying power for light, sound, and fun. More power wherever you need it. Silver Seal from Ever Ready. Extraordinary power at an ordinary price. Well, YouTubers, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for tuning in this week for PE Slick Podcast. I'm your host, Ranger Matt, signing off. Until next time, you have a good night now. See ya.